Well, good morning and welcome this morning. It's good to be with you. Um, I want to extend a special invitation out to our Mill Creek campus who is joining us this morning via simulcast, which is always a little bit unique for me when I'm here and they're watching it because normally I'm, it's like a rip in the time space continuum or something like that. But it's good to be together as we continue in this series on the book of, of Ruth as we've been tracking through this story. I, uh, I, I can still to this day remember sitting in my dorm room at Moody and calling my, my dad and asking for his advice. I was in that place in my relationship with Sherry where I was very much in love, very, very certain of the fact that I wanted to spend the rest of my life with her, that, it, that, that I wanted to be committed to her and I wanted our relationship to go forward and yet I was dealing with this this fear about where she was at. I was nothing in regards to, you know, wondering if she was the one. I was 100% convinced of that. It wasn't even so much that where she was at in the moment, but, but where she would be at in a month from now, or six months from now, or a year from now, or 10 years from now, as it related to me. Would, would she still feel that way? Was I opening myself up for a, a, a broken heart, essentially? And I can remember my dad's words to me in that moment. I remember him saying, son, anything in life worth having or anyone in life worth being with, uh, being with is worth taking a risk for. It, essentially, he, he was saying that love will always be risky. There will always be a certain degree of, of vulnerability that comes with it. And maybe you can relate to being in that place where, where hope and fear are sort of coexisting at the same time where there's that, that vulnerability. And this is where we find ourselves in the story of Ruth now, where at one point there was only fear, there was only trepidation and worry and vulnerability. Hope has now emerged. And, and, and Naomi and Ruth, they find themselves in that place of wondering, what happens next? Should we, should we dare to be hopeful? about what God might do. Last week, if you were here, remember Ruth and Naomi, they have experienced this incredible display of love. Um, in fact, it was a, a unique Hebrew word. Pastor Jeff talked about it here. I talked about it at the Mill Creek campus, that, that hesed love um, that, that is uniquely godlike, this extravagant display of generosity. Ruth is off in the fields of, of Boaz working there, and, and he, in sort of an unexpected way, just begins to display this to, to Ruth. In fact, when Ruth comes home from working in the fields in order to provide a little bit of food for, for her and Naomi, she comes home literally with weeks or a month worth of food. So much so that Naomi sees all of it, and she said, where, where have you been? Where, where did all of this come from? Who, who has done this for us? And then Ruth tells her about, about Boaz, about his generosity, about his care, about how he was putting Ruth in that moment under his belonging and providing protection and provision. And now we see this shift in Naomi, that, that she is beginning to connect the dots. This is from chapter two, verse 20. This is Naomi's response to all of this. She says, the Lord bless him, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law. He, speaking of Yahweh now, of her God, he has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead. And then she added, this man is our close relative. He's one of our guardian redeemers. And so this tangible, benevolent, generous expression of God's love that's been demonstrated through Boaz to Naomi and Ruth, this, this person is the very same person who has the ability to redeem their family line. He's their, their guardian or their kinsman redeemer. Now, at first glance, what, what appears to be just an amazing day, a, a really great day, like one of the best days ever, now has gone to a life-altering day with the potential to change the course of, of Ruth and Naomi's future forever. 
and it all happening out here in, in the fields of a man named Boaz. This is where we find ourselves in, in the story, surprisingly, or perhaps not surprisingly, Naomi is, is telling Ruth, keep, keep going back to the field of Boaz. He's protecting you, he's watching over you, and she stays there all the way through the end of the harvest. And so now we're back in, in Ruth chapter three, and what I wanna kinda unpack this morning is I want us to look at this, what happens here through the lens of the eyes of the perspective of the three major characters here. So let's begin in verse one. It says, one day Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi, said to her, my daughter, I must find a home for you where you will be provided for. Now Boaz, with whose women you have worked, is a relative of ours. Tonight he will be winnowing barley and the threshing floor. Wash, put on perfume, and get dressed in your best clothes. And then go down to the threshing floor, but don't let him know you are there until he has finished eating and drinking. And when he lies down, note the place where he is lying. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what to do. Let's pause there. Because I, I want to begin by considering what I'm going to call Naomi's hope. Naomi's hope. You remember last October, it was about the, um, the Powerball lotto was all over the news. Because the jackpot has escalated to $1.5 billion. Like the sort of money that, that it's almost hard to wrap your heads around. And, and I, I don't really play the lotto, but you can't help when it's in the news like that to kind of start like you're driving around, you hear it on the radio, and start to daydream a little bit, right? Like when you start to ask yourself like what, just what if? Like what, what if... Uh, somehow I, I won this thing. Like, what would that do to my life? What, how would that change? You, you begin to daydream, what would, I, what would I buy first? And I began to think about like all the, the generous things I would do, because you're trying to like, in case God's listening to this thing going on in your head, you want to like make a case that you would be a good steward of this. And, and you just sort of daydream about what if this life-altering, life-changing thing happened? Which, the, of course, the irony of that, this is a, a side note, is like how destructive. Have you ever seen like the studies done about how like the lotto just ruins people's lives? But I also, again, reconcile that that wouldn't happen. To, I, I would be the exception to the rule, of course. <laughs> See, I think, I think Naomi in these verses is asking her, the, the, herself the question, what if? And for good reason. They, they have been the benefactors now of this incredible display of this, this hesed love. And, and it's from the one who is able to redeem them out of the despair and destruction that they have suffered. See, I, th I think Naomi's hope here is twofold. First, there is the possibility, the very real possibility now of preserving her family line. The, the, the greatest tragedy that could befall somebody in the ancient Near East culture is exactly what Naomi has lived. The death of her husband, the, the death of her two sons before they were able to have children, specifically boys, now means that her family line is in dire straits, facing extinction. And that was about the worst thing you can imagine in that culture. But now, through this, this guardian redeemer, there's the possibility of, of restoration, there's the possibility of someone coming in and, and restoring their family line so that it can continue. And so Naomi, is, she has reason to hope again. The second is, is more overtly stated here in these verses. She just is genuinely concerned and worried for and desires to protect Ruth. She understands Ruth's situation, the, the reality of living in a, a country different than your own, with the awareness and understanding that, that you're there as a, a, a widow, you're, you're living in poverty, whatever degree of, of protection and connection that she had with community because of Naomi's heritage, she understands that when Naomi is gone, when she's gone, so will that protection be gone. So, so will Ruth's only sort of stability 
be gone. And so she desires something greater for her. She wants to protect and provide her. She wants to make sure that she's cared for. This is what, if you remember, all the way back in chapter 1, when, when Naomi is leaving and heading back to Jerusalem, she says to her daughter-in-law, stay here. The, the only hope for you is here in Moab. It's here with your families. The only possibility of, of you finding um, a, a husband and restoring your family lines, it's, it's back here. But Ruth chooses to go with her, and so Naomi, she acts now on this hope. See, what was previously in the story, this, this previously paralyzing effect of despair and, and, and um, desperation has now been overcome by the audacity of hope, by the possibility that something could change. And so she takes matters into her own hands and she seeks to provide, to create an opportunity for Boaz to act on behalf of both her and Ruth. Now, I think it's, it's worth noting here that there are a number of views about what Naomi is suggesting to Ruth in these passages. Um, some, some would suggest, some see this as Naomi's efforts to inspire or to instruct Ruth to essentially seduce Boaz, to sort of, if you will, force the situation. So the problem I have with that is that that seems to ignore the progressing story that the narrator is telling throughout these chapters here. And, and beyond that, it seems to be out of line with what has been this incredible display of character of both Ruth and and Boaz, so I do see romance here, and I see love, but this is not just mere seduction for the sake of, of providing opportunity. Instead, I, I believe Naomi is instructing Ruth here to present herself to Boaz as one who is available to be redeemed. In, in this ancient culture, it was customary for a a widow following the death of her husband to remain in a state of mourning, sometimes for an extended period of time. In fact, this, this may have been one of the very ways that, that Ruth was displaying her commitment and her faithfulness out of respect for her now past husband to Naomi. It, it's remaining connected by continuing in this state of, of mourning, but now Naomi appears to be telling Ruth, it's time to end this. It's time to come out of this state of mourning and, and to present yourself to Boaz as one who is ready and available to, to be married. Like you get the, uh, the impression of like the, the slightly over-involved mother or mother-in-law, right? Like you got to get back out there and, and that's, what, that's what's happening in the story. There's all, there's all kinds of cultural nuances that, that are taking place here, that we don't have time to dig into each and every one of them. But what I want us to see and understand is that in the mind of, of Naomi, hope is now meeting opportunity, enough so that, that fear is being overcome. Naomi is, is now acting on hope, and her actions and her requests of Ruth, these are, these are both bold and, and risky, but in her mind, she's asking the question, what if? What if these acts of love, this, this display of Hesed love from Boaz, what if it's an indication of an even greater willingness? More so, even, even beyond that, what if, what if Yahweh, what if God has not finished writing their story? What if, what if it's possible that the one who has the opportunity to redeem her family also has the desire to do so. What if Naomi has hope again? This next perspective that we see then is, is what I'm going to call Ruth's offering. It, it's how she understands and processes what Naomi asks of her. And, and again, what we're going to discover is there's this great deal of vulnerability here. Like, you all know the vulnerability of, of giving a gift, right? Like, we experience that. I'm talking like a, a, a personal gift that you really put some thought and effort into in order to, to give to someone. Not like a gift card kind of gift, like, right? 
There's, there's very little risk involved in that. But when you know somebody and you go out and you pick something because you want it to mean something to them, there's, there's a degree of vulnerability to that. I can still remember as a middle school student, I had this crush on, on this girl in my class and I wanted at Christmas time to get her a little something as kind of a display of my affection, if you will. I went out, my parents took me to the ball and I, uh, the mall and I bought um, U2's Rattle and Hum um, because I knew like that would communicate love, right? And, and I can still remember going up. I remember my parents driving me to her house, like getting out of the car, walking up her front porch, ringing the doorbell. Like I can still feel like my stomach, I kind of want to throw up just as I'm talking about this, right? All the nerves that you go in that moment when you give somebody something and you hope that they understand it and that they receive it because to receive it in at some small way is receiving you. And to reject it or to feel like this didn't really, this doesn't matter to me, that we own that, right? We feel that in and of ourselves. Look back in verse 5 now. This is Ruth's response to Naomi. She says, I will do whatever you say, Ruth answered. So she went down to the threshing floor and she did everything her mother-in-law told her to do. When Boaz had finished eating and drinking and was in good spirits, he went over to lie down at the far end of the grain pile. Ruth approached quietly, uncovered his feet, and lay down. And in the middle of the night, something startled the man. He turned, and there was a woman lying at his feet, which, to be fair, that, that would be startling. <laughs> and he says, who are you, he asked. I am your servant, Ruth, she said. Spread the corner of your garment over me since you are a guardian redeemer of our family. Ruth, Ruth is an extraordinary person. I, I have loved preaching through, studying this, and, and talking about this as a community, especially as the dad of three daughters, as we're talking about this exemplary woman of, of courage and strength and character and conviction and commitment. Here in this scene, Ruth makes herself incredibly vulnerable as an act of love for Naomi. She is the one, make no mistake, who is taking on the risk. See, what, what these verses depict for us, this is, this is an ancient marriage proposal, but it's not, this is not how it is typically done. And granted, and at this point in time in the story, Ruth and Naomi both have a, a window into Boaz's character. They, bo they have a sense of who he is, and at the same time, despite that, this is incredibly risky. Th this is a bold move on, on Ruth's part. Ruth goes to Boaz and she both directly and symbolically asks for him to be for her and for Naomi, their guardian redeemer. Last week, we talked briefly about the significance of, of the idea of the guardian redeemer. And I want to just expound on this for a moment if we can. This, this concept in the Old Testament, it was a, a provision in the Levitical law so that when tragedy or devastation would strike a family, there was someone who, who had the ability or the right or the call to be able to, to act on their behalf. And so if, if somebody in a family line was, was sold into slavery out of desperation, the guardian redeemer could come and they had the right to be able to buy that person back. Or if in the case of a limelech, if a piece of family property is, is sold away, the guardian redeemer can come back and restore that to keep it in the family line so they have a way to provide for themselves. If there was an injustice in your family that had not been taken care of, the guardian redeemer could come and act on behalf of the family to bring about justice. They were there to provide for the weak and the vulnerable. The, the guardian redeemer is a, a savior relative. That was their role in the Old Testament. And there were three things that, that had to be true of someone who was called to act as the guardian redeemer for the family. One, they had to have the position. They, they had to be in line to be able to act. Not anyone could fulfill this role in, in their culture. Secondly, they had to have the means. They, they had to have the sheer ability to be able to bear the cost of what it would 
take to redeem someone. So they, whether that was mere strength, if you're talking about a justice situation, or if it was financial means, if you're talking about restoring land or buying someone out of safety, they had to have the ability to do that. But then thirdly, and perhaps most importantly, they had to want to. They, they had to be willing to take on that role, which is why you see Ruth come and, and ask Boaz. Like, picture this with me. Ruth knows what she is asking. She, she knows who she is. Think about all the times throughout these first three chapters when they've talked about Ruth, they've, they've referred to her as Ruth the Moabite. It's as if the narrator will not let us forget that, that this is an outsider. This is somebody who doesn't belong to the family of Israel, which just adds to the sort of just overt, extravagant nature of what Boaz is doing here. She understands this. She understands that, that she is outside of the family, that she is poverty-stricken, she's a widow, she's desperate, and yet she's an incredible person of character. And she's taking on a tremendous risk to come to Boaz to ask him and say, will you, will you take me as your wife? Will you act to restore our family? Look again in, in verse 9 here. This is what Ruth says to Boaz. He says, she says, spread the corner of your garment over me, since you are the guardian redeemer of our family. If you think back to chapter 2, when, when Ruth first shows up in the fields of Boaz, and Boaz is just sort of pouring on this generosity, if you remember this, he says, allow her to, to glean with the workers. And, and Ruth at the time is just overwhelmed and curious. And she even asks, why are you doing this? Why, what is motivating you? Like, why have you been so good to me? And this is Boaz's response to her. This is verse two. And this has kind of been our, our theme verse throughout this entire series. Chapter two, verse 12, he says, may the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. See that, this word here in, in chapter uh, three, or in chapter two, that's translated as wings is, is the very same word in chapter three that's translated the corner of your garment. When she asked him, will you, will you put the corner of your garment, which seems like a, an odd thing to have such a diverse translation and yet both of in both of these instances the, it's a picture of protection it's a picture of of belonging under the care of under the protection of so essentially as Ruth is approaching Boaz she's saying Boaz will you be the answer to what you prayed for on behalf of me will, will you be the answer to your own prayer Ruth approaches Boaz in, in humility and in surrender and vulnerability. She, she doesn't come to him as a victim to demand her rights, but she rather comes as one who is ready to serve. That's, that's part of the significance of laying at his feet in the position of a servant. She says to Boaz, I respect you. I, I trust you. And I I put the fate of my life in your hands. Ruth is saying to Boaz, I need you to save me. And I'm, I am ready and willing to be saved. She comes in an act of surrender. So Ruth now has put her life in the hands of Boaz, her family line. And she waits in this incredible vulnerability for him to respond. And this is Boaz's promise. Boaz's promise. This is the third perspective we see here in these verses. Now pick it up again back in verse 9. When he asks the question, who are you? And she responds and says, I am your servant, Ruth, she said. Spread the corner of your garment over me, since you are the guardian redeemer of our family. Now in verse 10, the Lord bless you, my daughter, he replied. This kindness is greater than that which you showed earlier. You've not run after younger men whether rich or poor. So pause here for just a moment. Boaz 
wakes up in this moment after a night of, of celebrating the harvest with his workers, celebrating God's faithfulness and provision, and only to discover a, a woman sleeping at his feet. You, you, he is genuinely shocked in this moment, and he asks the person to identify themselves. And when she does, when she says, this is Ruth, and furthermore, when she says why she's there, Boaz's response is, is unexpected and surprising, but it's, but it's in line with who he is. See, instead of taking offense to Ruth's presence here, instead of shaming her for her boldness, her her risky behavior, Boaz speaks these incredible words of, of blessing and of, of provision, affirmation to Ruth. See, because once again, Boaz seems to perceive or understand that what Ruth is doing here, this is, this is just another display of this Hesed love that, that we've been talking about. In fact, he, he identifies it here in verse 10 when he says this kindness, that's the same word, that this, this has a love, this is even greater than what you've done before. This is, is this unique godlike demonstration of sacrificial love. This is even this is even greater than what I saw in you before. And he affirms it in her. The culmination of this encounter comes in these following verses, now in verse 11. And now, my daughter, don't be afraid. I will do for you all that you ask. All the people of, the, uh, of my town know that you are a woman of noble character. Although it's true that I am a guardian redeemer of our family, there is another who is more closely related than I. So there's a little bit of a twist in the story now. Stay here for the night. And in the morning, if he wants to do his duty as your guardian redeemer, good, let him redeem you. But if he is not willing, as surely as the Lord lives, I will do it. Lie here until morning. And so she lay at his feet until morning and got up before anyone could be recognized. And he said to her, no one must know that a woman came to the threshing floor. Again, some people have read that as like a scandal sort of into it. It's, I don't think it is. I think, again, this is Boaz seeking to protect Ruth. And he also said, bring me your shawl, the shawl you are wearing, and hold it out. And when he did so, he poured into it six measures of barley and placed the bundle on her. And then he went back to town. See, if you're, imagine if you can for a moment being a, a Jewish boy or, or a little girl in your home when your mother or your father is, is telling you the, the story of their history, the story of, of Ruth and Boaz and Naomi, and you, you've been developing this all along and you get to this point in the story this is this is the moment where you're clinging to what is Boaz going to do what's going to happen to Ruth and Naomi and and here in these words I will do for you all that you ask this is this culmination of 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 an of a of a hope of what might happen starting to be realized now that you're clinging to these words Boaz sees Ruth's character. He sees this incredible display of, of love and he sees what she is asking of him and he says yes. He says yes to her marriage proposal. He says, I will redeem you. He says, I will pay the price that you can't pay and I will make the sacrifice that you can't make. I will buy you out of poverty. I will restore your family line. I will be your guardian redeemer. Again, there's this, this added little portion there. He says, but I'm not first in line. And we're going we're gonna to come back to that next week. And then he does something even, even more. He takes her shawl and, and he puts six measures of barley. This is like um, engagement barley, I guess, if you will. Like it, it, it's, it's this symbol of, of his commitment to Ruth. Beyond that, it's a, it's a symbol of his commitment to Naomi and really ultimately to, to the clan and the family of Elimelech. You see, the story of, of Naomi, the story of Ruth, the story of Boaz, it's the story of salvation inside of the story of salvation. 
It's inside of what our, our Chapel Street kids call the big God story. So the whole Old Testament up to this point, it's been progressing towards this, this, this work that God is doing to return humanity to what he created them for. When what, when, what was lost at, when sin entered the picture and all the brokenness and the hurt and the pain and we see God working and bringing it back so that we might live in this unobstructed relationship with our creator, God, and inside of this greater narrative of Yahweh's love for humanity, we're provided with this picture and this display of redemption and salvation through this ancient story of a woman named Ruth. Oftentimes we find ourselves in our relationship with God asking ourselves, what does this look like? What is this supposed to look like? I remember when Sherry and I were just newly married. You're in that stage of life, you're, you're sort of trying to answer the question, what, is it, what does it mean to be a husband? Like, what is this going to look like? How do I love my wife well? How do I communicate this to her? How do I display this to her? You're still learning what this looks like. And simultaneous to that, my, um, my grandma and grandpa dining are on my mom's side of the family. My grandma's um, was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. And so we would come home for visits to see family. And every time we came home, you could see sort of this progression of the disease in her. She was more and more confused about who people were and why we were there and what was going on. And alongside of this, consistently, you would see my grandpa. You would see him answering the same question over and over and over again. You would, you would see him having to um, bring her back to, to her seat or whatever because she was confused and scared and uncertain of what was going on around. And this was his life day after day after day. And as the disease progressed, the call and the role of him to be for her, this um, care provider grew. And I remember being this young man and, and learning what it meant to be a husband and wondering what did it look like and watching my grandfather's care of my grandma and saying, it looks like that. So that that's what it looks like. That's what it means to be a loving and caring husband. See, the, the story of Ruth, the story of Naomi, the, the, the work of Boaz here, it helps us understand what it looks like for us to be redeemed by our God. It helps us understand what salvation is. It helps us understand, it helps Israel understand, and it, it helps understand what, that he has come in order to be our redeemer. Paul says it this way in Ephesians chapter 1. He says, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of his grace. When we find ourselves wondering what it looks like to be loved by God, we come back to the story of Ruth and Naomi. We come back to this picture of redemption and we say, it looks like that. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you again for this incredible display of, of this unique God-like love that is being poured out in commitment and in connection to you. And we ask, God, that you would again show us through this ancient story what you have done for us, that we would understand more personally the way that you have loved us and how you acted and moved in order to redeem us. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.